Hey, hey, what's up, guys? It's Jordan with the Laundromat Resource Podcast. This is show number 53, and I'm pumped that you're here today because today we're talking with Eli, who's basically building three businesses in one, and he gets this business in a very, very unique way, and his path to laundromat ownership is very unique, but it's also, I think, very applicable to a lot of people who want to get into this business. So I know you're going to love this because not only does he have a lot to to uh, share with those trying to buy their first laundromat and the ways that he went about it. There's a lot of wisdom to be gained there, but he also was building a behemoth of a business right now. And hearing the way that he's building this out is, uh, I mean, it's awe inspiring. I'm like, I'm so excited right now. I'm just jazzed up from this interview and I know you're going to love it. You're going to get a ton out of it. Cannot wait for you to meet Levi and uh, hear his story and and benefit from his wisdom and experience in this industry because uh, he's got a ton to give. Uh, all right. Before we jump into that, though, I just want to say, man, the, every single one of our forums have been active this week. There's a lot going on over there. Awesome, awesome conversations happening. Uh, go jump in into those conversations. That's where growth happens. That's where uh, we, you know, come together as a community and share with one another our wisdom and our experience, share our stories, um, answer each other's questions, engage in conversations and meet up. There's a lot, one of my favorite things that's happening on the forums. I mentioned this already, but uh, people are connecting with people in the same areas, uh, which is just super cool to see. So, you know, if you're looking to connect with other people interested in laundromats, uh, you know, go introduce yourself on the introductions forum and uh, go meet some people who are in your area and some people who are not in your area, uh, guaranteed to, uh, guaranteed to help you grow your business and yourself personally, uh, or your money back hundred percent. So <laughs> it's a free forum, but, uh, still money back guarantee on that one. Uh, all right. So anyways, laundromatresource.com slash forums over there. I'll put a link down in the description to this and everything else we talk about. If you're on YouTube, it'll be down below. Um, you can also find it at uh, laundromatresource.com slash show 53. Five, three. So exciting, exciting times. Uh, go jump in, ask a question, answer a question, do it every single week uh, because that is, again, how you grow and also how you get networked in this community. And after listening to today's podcast with Eli, you should be more convinced than ever that it's really important to connect with good people in this industry. I know I am. And uh, man, you know, Eli is walking proof of that. So uh, and you'll see that kind of throughout his whole interview today. Uh, the other thing I want to just take a quick second to congratulate Dave, laundromat millionaire men's uh, man. He just had an article come out about him on business insider this week. If you haven't checked it out, I'll link to it down below. Um, it is behind a paywall business insider paywall, but you also, if you want to check it out, you can sign up for uh, a free trial and then cancel that trial if you need to. I don't know if I can really say that on here, but you know, we do what we do. Uh, but anyways, uh, go check that article out. Super, super cool uh, to see him featured there representing our industry and uh, just sharing with uh, a wider audience about what it is that we do and what are the benefits of it and his um, story in the midst of it. So go check that out. Congrats, Dave. Keep on doing it, man. You are killing it over there and I'm loving every single minute of it. All right, man, let's just jump into it with Eli and you can hear his story because it's awesome. And I know you're going to get a ton out of it. So let's do it with Eli Carey today, right now. Let's just do it right now. <laughs> Eli, thank you, man, for coming on the show. I'm super excited to have you today. How you doing? I'm doing well. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Oh man. Thank you for coming on. I'm excited, excited to hear your story. Uh, and you know, I want to hear a lot about your experience with a lot of mats, but before we get into that, why don't you tell us a little bit about who you are and then we'll go into how you got into the industry. Okay. Uh, I grew up in Oregon. Um, I spent my formidable years there. Um, and that was significant because my dad was a pastor, but he was also a home builder. Um, so that's where I sort of got a picture of what it looks like to do what you got to do to support a family. He had a, a, a pretty uh, productive church, but he also built homes and, and just uh, did whatever he needed to, to, to take care of us. Uh, when I was in high school, we moved to Cortez, uh, which is a very small town in Southern Colorado. I didn't enjoy that much. And it's at the first opportunity I, I, I jumped ship. Um, uh, after high school, I moved away for a short time. I moved back to Colorado and then I joined the army. 
Uh, so in 2000, I joined the army and um, they trained me up and sent me to Korea. Um, I spent my first duty station there, uh, went to Fort Bragg, um, didn't enjoy that atmosphere as much. And mm. so I um, got out of the army or active duty army and went to the Colorado Army National Guard and started going to college. Um, and that was supposed to be that um, I was going to get out of the military in 2002 and be done with that. Um, I ended up staying for 20 years uh, and just retired from the army uh, last October. Hey, uh, congratulations. Uh, thank you. Thank you. And I'm, I'm, I'm glad to be done with that. Um, I had about 10 years active and about 10 years uh, guard when all is said and done. Uh, I left as a first sergeant and I have some terrific memories and I learned a, uh, a ton of valuable experiences. Um, but through that process, it also reinforced my desire to um, work for myself um, when the opportunity presented itself. So as I was in active duty during one of my stints through the state of Colorado, I started brainstorming with my father-in-law for businesses we could do together that would give me a platform to leave active duty. Um, we came up with a list of cash-based uh, activities, including uh, laundromats, um, coin-op vending, um, small candy vending, and car washes. Um, and then we Usual scoured... Suspects. <laughs> yep. We scoured uh, all the, the resources, to see what was available. And then for us, um, you know, we needed a relatively low cash barrier to entry. Uh -huh. um, and so Car what we landed on, the what we landed on was vending. Um, and we bought a vending route that had both full service vending. So um, soda and snacks and small candy machines. And then as we grew that, um, I was still active duty. And so I would do that uh, with my free time. Uh, what, what I had. <laughs> and um, we realized we could scale the small candy vending very quickly. So we sold the soda and snack side of it to a relative. Um, and then we scaled on the small candy vending. We bought several existing routes. We hired in-person and telemarketed locators and we hit the streets. And I, I got up to about 450, 500 locations with little candy machines in them. Wow. And then I got orders to go to uh, deployment in like 2016, <laughs> 17. And the relative uh, that we sold the full line vending to, we had, we paid him to, to run the route. Um, he did the best he could. Uh, it, there's a ton of attrition with it. When we came back, it was somewhat smaller mm -hmm. than when we left because he was balancing his own business as well as our business. Right. It wasn't his full-time gig. So I got back and, and uh, we bought an, an additional router, a really good one from a couple of gentlemen that that had sort of aged out. He was uh, 82 and 78 and they were still uh, out there getting locations. They were awesome. <laughs> um, took, took that on and we kept going a little bit. Um, through that process, I ended up getting um, several pieces of equipment in a laundromat. Um, so I had a rack, uh, which is, you know, two inch toys that, that you can get that are a little nicer. You can get the branded stuff with the DC comics and whatnot. And I put a coin pusher and a crane in there. Um, and then I, I do a revenue share with the owner. Um, and I got that in place and I check in with him from time to time. And over uh, about two, two and a half years, I got to know him, built a relationship with him. And we were just talking off chance one day and he said, you know, I'm going to sell the laundromat. So um, I said, well, what, what, what information do you have? And it accelerated relatively quickly from that point. Um, and ultimately I took over the laundromat by assuming his debt. Um, and, and that's about it. Um, there was no cash involved. There was some other small legal considerations to get through, but I, I started a business. Um, and whereas with the candy business, it was a 50, 50 split with my father-in-law. This one I did on my own. Um, and it was, uh, as far as I could tell, um, and I had several people review the information with me and, mm -hmm. you know, I'm a brilliant laundromat owner at this point. It was just going to be able to on here. Nothing right. <laughs> <laughs> it was just going to be able to pay its own bills. And that was sort of the point. I just mm -hmm. needed to break even. Um, that was in 2019. So in February 1st, 2019, I took over a laundromat and a dry cleaner. Um, they were. Uh, together, 5,500 square feet, and it's about half and half. Um, the dry cleaner and the laundromat catered to substantially different socioeconomic bases. And so I had to learn both sides, but the laundromat was the side that I had spent more time in, at least with my candy machine. So that's the one that resonated with me initially. Um, I wasn't there a bunch. I inherited the staff, um, including uh, 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 
two members of the previous owner's family. So his wife and son stayed on um, and they were tremendous in, in um, uh, carrying on the business. And, uh, you know, they already had rapport with the customers. And then the presser um, stayed on in the back and she had been there for 20 years. Um, and so she's an expert at what she does. And so I, I had staff in place, so I didn't have to be there day to day. And that was exactly what I wanted. Um, and then things started breaking. Um, and then uh, unexpected uh, problems occurred one after the other. I had looked at getting some financing to do a partial retool. Um, and then I had a uh, water leak that ended up to be in a $15,000 emergency fix rerouting. Uh, I had to, I had to rerun pipe entirely. Um, and so I, uh, had already got approval through Dexter to, um, get this loan. And I called and, uh, said, please cancel the loan. And they weren't too pleased with me, <laughs> uh, yeah. Dexter financing, but it, you know, it is what it is. So, so we worked through that. That was late in 2019. And then I realized I needed to start paying a little bit more attention to how things were going and why, um, and uh, get really good at keeping the equipment running and starting to update the place. I'll back up just slightly. When I took it over, it wasn't a zombie mat and it's not a nice modern mat. It's somewhere in between, okay. which is almost good enough. It's that, um, it, 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 you know, in like good to great, they talk about the difference between something that's working and something that could be extraordinary. It right. worked yeah. uh, and, it, and it got in a steady amount of customers, but it was never going to push me over the top. And that's, that's still the case. It's a tweener size. Um, and it's a mix of equipment, but the ceiling was falling in, um, and watermarked everywhere. Um, but the good news was a new building owner had put a brand new roof on it. So we redid the ceiling tiles. We started painting things. We started updating what we could cheaply. And then we started getting to fixing equipment. Um, the son who stayed on, I actually made that his primary focus and he's left the company to, to do skilled trades, but he's still our repair guy. Um, and he's, he's fantastic at it. Um, and over time he's, uh, with that being his primary focus, he's gotten really adept at diagnosing and fixing the equipment for us. So that's a, a big priority, but I came to a realization at the end, end of 2019 that the laundry mat wasn't actually my profit center. Um, it, because like I said, it was steady. Um, the equipment mix of what it was, was fine. I raised my prices and I, I did what I could to make it as inviting for the public as possible, uh, and put in a new alarm system, things like that to deal with the, the late night, uh, problems. But I realized for my intents and purposes, I was going to make more money per dollar I spent and per effort I invested on the dry cleaning side. Mm. Um, for every dollar I spent on the laundry side, I could expect hundreds in return, but the, but it was a thousands multiple on the other side. That um, sounds there, very ominous to me thinking that at the end of 2019, knowing now something's coming <laughs> that 2020 is on the way. <laughs> yeah. Well, let me pause you. Okay. Cause I'm like, you're saying all this stuff and I'm like fascinated by so much of what you're saying. And I want to hear kind of the end of 2019 on, but real quick, let me just back you up for a second, because I have a lot of coaching clients that I talk to who want to get into laundromats, but maybe they don't have a lot of money. Um, and you mentioned two different things that I think are options for people trying to get into laundromats. Um, and, and you utilize both of them. Uh, one is starting a little bit smaller with vending. So I want to talk to you a little bit about vending. And then the other one was acquiring the laundromat basically by assuming the debt. So I want to talk to you a little bit about that too. So can we back up just for a second and talk about vending and how you decided to get into that and, and what you had to do to actually get into that? And if you would recommend people getting into that? Um, I would, but find the thing that makes sense both for your skill sets and your market. So the thing that was always going to hold me back in vending and continues to be the case is I don't enjoy sales mm -hmm. and I don't enjoy engaging in cold calls. So we did a most of our growth and unfortunately our market could bear it, but that's not the case with every market by acquiring existing routes and leveraging their best locations. So we'd upgrade the equipment. We, we started with these small three head plastic machines, hundreds of them. Um, uh, actually, uh, at one point, we probably had 600 of these little guys. Um, and for very good locations, we'd leverage it up to a four select or an eight select. And we got really, really good at small candy vending. 
Um, I found uh, I, I was really patient with locations. I'd try a different product mix and over time, just gradually uh, change it out. Even low producing locations, I stuck with them longer than, than would be recommended at times. And some of them ended up being fantastic locations. And then eventually we had enough sense to start vending toys, no spoilage. Um, really, if, if a toy starts becoming less popular, you just throw it into a mystery mix right. and it, it revitalizes. <laughs> and so there's just no downside to that. So bouncy balls and toys became sort of, uh, a, a, an excellent way for us to continue to leverage locations. I had one Mexican restaurant with an eight select and I just couldn't get anything to move. And I put a couple toys in there and they sold out immediately. Mm. Well, long story short, I have eight toys in there now. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, I, I just was, I just initially was selling the wrong thing. And part of that was because the machine we started with only did candy. It didn't have uh, a, a gumball wheel, so it couldn't do gumballs, bouncy balls or toys. Mm. Um, and so part of that was um, hard headedness and just, and just working through it until we, we went through the wall, but ton of research. I was very active on the forums. I read whatever books were available uh, not a ton, yeah. but there are some. Um, and now there's YouTube channels and, and, and podcasts, but in 2012, 2013, there were not. Um, so now there's a lot more resources and very good, robust Facebook groups about vending um, that I still keep keep my foot in. But for all intents and purposes, I'm out of vending. Mm-hmm. Um, I saw vending from the beginning, even when my father in law approached me and said, let's do vending um, as the training wheel to learn how to file for a business, how to run a, a business. And for the most part, I never had employees. If I did, it was my brother helping me ship out machines mm-hmm. or it was my, my family member helping me run the route and cover for me uh, in a pinch. But, um, and I had all the flexibility in the world. Um, if I didn't feel like going out on a route one day, I, I just didn't. <laughs> so it served some of my nature really well. But at the same time, if I needed to go out on a 12 hour day, I went out on a 12 hour day. Right. Um, we were fortunate to make some um, network well within our market. And eventually we partnered with a, a few different companies that did charity collections and charity collections um, really paid the bills. Um, there was no fluctuation. Uh, vending machines fluctuate with time. Uh, in the summer months, some of the candy melts a little quicker or sticks to the wall or whatever breaks down. But charity collections, even during the pandemic, have gone strong, especially the ones that have drive throughs So we were able to, within the, the umbrella of vending, find the, the ones that worked for us and the ones that gave us the flexibility to operate. Um, and I didn't require a lot of income. Uh, I was still doing National Guard time, so I'd still get paid to go in and I'd get paid for my two weeks of, of training and then to go to schools and stuff. So it, it, the collective income was good enough that mm-hmm. I, I never I never had to really try to break through with vending. Um, I believe to really break through, you need to leverage the higher revenue, higher risk categories. So bigger equipment, um, and, uh, coin pushers out a larger scale, which again, varies state to state in Colorado. It's no problem. People have robust pusher routes. Um, but then, you know, as we know, during the pandemic, everybody that had, uh, uh, even the national companies that had the King supers and Walmarts, all their, all of them are unavailable. Mm-hmm. Um, we, we made almost no revenue, uh, in 2020 with vending. Um, and I'm, I'm all but giving the route to the gentleman that covered for me previously. We're selling it to him for a small amount. And again, what he'll get out of that is a bunch of equipment and some existing locations that he can revive and he'll get the charity route, which is going to be good. And there's more coming on that. Uh, the charity collection charity route is like, those are like the bins where you drop off clothes and stuff. Is that what you're talking about? No, this is like at a uh, fast food restaurants and national national change where you donate your loose change. Somebody oh, oh. has to come collect, deposit, and um, put that information into a database. And that was that was us for our market. Um, and so we cover, and and with that comes uh, surveys. You go in, in break rooms and take pictures of the sodas and snack machines and stuff like that, and that pays pretty well for minimal minimal effort. So it was just a kind of a niche, but super steady. So if somebody wanted, I don't want to like beat this drum too long, but if somebody wanted to get into vending, what, what should, I mean, okay, let's say they jump into some of the forums and watch some of the YouTubes and stuff. What's their first step to get into their first vending route? Craigslist in any major market. So any city, you know, hundreds, hundreds of thousands plus is flooded 
with equipment and routes for sale right now. Mm -hmm. Um, it's, it's more available than it had been previously. Um, and the quality of equipment that's available is excellent. Mm -hmm. Um, the, the, the machines continue to get better and better built. And, um, and it was always a quarter for, for a couple decades now. And now there's a ton of 50 cent plus mechanisms on the market and that's more properly priced. So the equipment and, and, and the, the routes are readily available. And then uh, coupled with the information, if it sounds like it, you know, it's something they can do. The cool thing is it's truly one of those side hustle opportunities. You can truly do any other career and, and build it. And you could build just a few locations and see if you like it and you can get out with it, get out of it with very low revenue uh, invested, or you can get after it and you can go get nice new equipment and you can go build a robust route and, mm-hmm. and, and go get pizza parlors and, and, and large Mexican restaurants, Chinese buffets. They're right for the picking. Yeah. It seems like right now would actually probably be a really good time to get into it. If that's something that like, if you have very low, uh, low amount of money to spend, nope. uh, now would be a, probably a really good time because you know, there's, I mean, everybody just spent a year not making any money. So the people who are wanting to get rid of their stuff and get something for it, you know, it might be a time to pick it up on the cheap and, and, uh, you know, just start hustling because, you know, hopefully things are turning around here and stuff will start opening back up even more. I mean, it is already. And, uh, and those routes hopefully will be able to be revived and you'll be able to pick up some more. So. In the best of times, um, a a candy route went for one X multiple. Um, so probably a 0.75 or less right now, but it, it's not like other industries. So if the route makes 30 K you buy it for 30 K or less, you mm-hmm. don't buy it in a more than one X multiple. So it is one of those true. Um, and, and, um, in a lot of cases you can go around with them while they collect and, and, uh, unless they were just clever enough to go, you know, juice the machines ahead of time or anything like that, which happens, but right. it's really, um, the due diligence on a, on a candy route is substantially easier than on other things because it's very easy to tell if the machine is uh, in bad shape or not, um, if it's been well-maintained or not, and then what's working, what's not, you know, do they have good graphics on there? Did they put uh, weird, weird product mixes in there? And so super easy to figure out if, if it's, and, and like you said, a lower cost point to, to try it out. Awesome. Cool. Well, thank you for sharing all that stuff. I, I think some people will be intrigued by that. So I appreciate that. Let me, sure. Let me ask you a little bit about, so you built this relationship with this laundromat owner and he got to a point where he was ready to sell. How did it, how did you guys come to the agreement that essentially you would take over the business by just assuming his debt? How did that, how did that all play out? Um, so he got to a point where the, the personal debts, associated with the laundromat, including the existing debts, um, along with his relationship with the landlord had soured. Um, Mm. The lease was coming up and he was not going to be given an opportunity to renew. Um, And then some external factors kind of came to came came to bear. And um, he was being advised to file bankruptcy. Mm. Um, I by assuming his debts, I, I gave him the opportunity to not. Um, not without risk. Um, and one of the debts was, um, hard to explain, but, but essentially junk. Uh, it was historical debt from that existed from two building owners that he had took on initially from the building owner who also ran and owned the laundromat. So just this weird debt that, that sort of hung out there. And then, um, equipment debt, which is pretty straightforward through Alliance. So I just took on his existing Alliance and that, that one's super simple, uh, as you know, in the, in the industry, but I contacted mm-hmm. Alliance simple one page paperwork and I had a new loan with them for the equipment. Um, three year, uh, it's almost paid off. Awesome. Yeah. Well, what made you feel like, I mean, okay. So when I look at a situation like that, I'm like, okay, you know, cause this is your first laundromat, right? So yep. I, you know, I work with a lot of first time buyers and, you know, rightfully so a lot of people are just very afraid to pull the trigger on that first one. And you're not only pulling the trigger on your first one, but you're taking over the debts of an owner who whose business obviously couldn't support his debts. Uh, So what made you feel like, yes, this is a great idea. I'm going to do this. (laughs) You know what I mean? Unbridled optimism. Yeah. (laughs) Um, I didn't didn't know what I didn't know. Um, I I did more research when I went into vending, which was a lower risk than I did going in the laundromat. Um, It went very quickly. 
I, I uh, started talking to him and, and within a couple months it was done. Yeah. Um, I didn't do a ton of research. I did review the financials with seven different people in, in my ecosystem that all said that, that, you know, my accountant said, this looks fine. Um, and, and then the other people that, that I trust said the numbers look good. And, and again, I wasn't looking to make a dime out of it. I had mm-hmm. a comfortable income coming out of the candies. I just needed it to pay its own debt. And then over time I thought, I can leverage this and I can increase it and, and, and I'll turn this into a re- retirement play down the road. Mm-hmm. It was later that I realized how much work I personally needed to put into it to make <laughs> it uh, succeed. Um, and the timing couldn't have been better uh, with, with that realization because 2019 quickly turned in, into 2020 right. and a lot to figure out during that time. <laughs> yeah. So would you, would you, uh, would you do it again if you had that opportunity? Yes. I do two things differently. Okay. Um, yeah, tell me I, that. I would have negotiated the debt way, way, way down. Um, and then uh, the other thing I knew nothing about. Um, and, and, and so when I went to negotiate the lease with the landlord company, who's a, who's a big builder here in Colorado, mm-hmm. um, very successful company, I'm talking with the, uh, the CEO and the CFO and I'm in there by myself yes. and, and they're like, well, this is what we give you. And I was like, I'll take whatever you say. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> I'm the anchor tenant. Um, there's several stores in, in the business, but I'm by, or in the building, but I'm by far the bit, biggest. Uh-huh. I didn't know the term anchor tenant. I didn't know what uh, tenant improvement allowance was. I would do all those things. I would have actually hired an attorney to yeah. help me navigate the process. And we would have negotiated the uh, ever living love out of that, that lease. And we would have got a more favorable terms and a more favorable terms on the debt as well, because the debt is through the landlord. Right. Uh, so I could have, I could have got, um, because they were very motivated to get somebody to take the business over for the same reasons as the building, as the business owner was motivated to sell it. They had the same, um, they had a big 5,500 amount of space that already had a plant built out, already had a laundromat built out. Mm-hmm. They would rather somebody just take it. So I, I had, more power than I realized. Right. I didn't know what to do with it. That's the only thing I do differently, but otherwise I definitely would have taken it over again. Yeah. Okay. So that, so you would just negotiate, you said two things, negotiating the debt down. Was and there the, another one? The lease and the debt. Oh, and the lease and the lease. Yeah. Yeah. Did, were you able to get, um, were you able to get a long-term lease from them? Or no? Yes. Yes, okay. I did. And, and uh, we're actually working to renegotiate that. I'm taking on more space in the building. Oh, nice. Well, use that as an opportunity to negotiate your current lease down again. <laughs> We're working on it. <laughs> now's a great time to be negotiating for a lease. So, yes, uh, okay. Would you, okay. So you would do it again and you got a couple of things you do differently. Would you recommend someone else do it as a way to get into their first laundromat? It, yes, but you have to have the tolerance and, and you have to have the, um, I, again, I had the ability to come and go from the candy business as I needed to. Mm-hmm. So I wasn't, tied to a normal 40 an hour, 40 hour work week. Mm -hmm. Um, and then, uh, you know, when I deployed during that timeframe, uh, even, even when I had the, the, those things, I had enough income coming in that it, that it didn't interrupt my activities. So I had the flexibility to go fight the big fires at the laundromat and solve, uh, unexpected problems that some people may not have if they're either too far, but really, um, tied down to a a real job, um, as it were, Mm -hmm. uh, and I went into it expecting to not make income. Um, right. I just needed it to service its own debt. Yeah. Okay. Awesome. Well, I mean, that, I think that's really helpful because, you know, I, I try to tell people there's, you know, really your, your, your own creativity is the only limit to what you can do in terms of trying to get into this business. Right. And that's, that's a very creative way that you just don't hear a lot you know, by assuming debt to get into the business and there's risk involved with that. But one of the points I wanted to make is that for anyone looking to get into this business who maybe doesn't have a ton of money to invest into it, the thing that you did probably not even on, well, not on purpose. It just, as a result of your situation though, you built relationships with people in the industry and you know, that, that allowed opportunities to be presented to you, right? That allowed this opportunity to, you know, 
be there when that laundromat owner was ready to sell and you were able to get into that laundromat. So I just, I wanted to point that out because there's a lot of people who sit at home in front of the TV with a laptop on their lap, scrolling through biz bin and biz buy sell, looking for laundromats for sale in their area. And while that's good, you know, if you, if you don't have money to put into your laundromat, you're probably not going to find a laundromat that way. Right. You need to get out there. You need to start meeting people. You need to start creating opportunities for stuff like this to happen for you. So just wanted to kind of point that out because I think that's an important thing that leads to a lot of people's opportunities. And the people who are sitting around are like, oh man, you got lucky. Well, yeah, kind of, but you also were out there building relationships with people and yep. put yourself in the path of that opportunity. So uh okay. The other thing you mentioned that is like probably the fear of many people getting into their laundromat is not not too long after you bought your laundromat, you had a huge fifteen thousand dollar water leak, right? Yep. How long into your your ownership was that? Uh, so seven eight months. <laughs> okay. Yep. Now, I mean, in I don't know. Uh, stuff like that's happened to me and it feels like a punch in the gut a little bit. Um, I mean, what was that? What what was that like? I mean, you're seven, eight months into this thing and things are kind of just cruising along and you get this big thing. You're trying to make a move, right? By retooling right. partially. And this, this happened. So what was that like? And, and how did you, how'd you deal with it? Well, we weren't a hundred percent sure. Uh, my water bill had gone up but I didn't properly associate that it's because I was probably losing water somewhere. So it had been happening for a while and it was under the floor. And then eventually the floor heaved and the tile lifted just slightly. And so my repair guy said, Hey, I think we got a water leak under there. And so we, we brought in a plumber and they did the, the moisture test and they were like, yeah. And it was one of my mains to one of my banks of washers. And it was, it was under, and they were like, we got to demo the floor and go get this. And I said, what if we cut the pipe and we went over the top instead? So I had developed a, a relationship with the distributor for Dexter because I was mm-hmm. going to reach it. And one of the things we were going to do is instead of going under, we were going to bring the piping from above to feed that bank of washers. And I said, is it possible we just cut this line going under, cap it, so there's no more water going under there, call it a loss, and uh, we go up over the top. And they're like, yeah. And they did a great job and they ran three separate drops from that line. The other thing we didn't have was isolation valves. Um, Mm -hmm. uh, And so then they were able to add isolation valves. They built these great chases going down into the banks of washers. Um, But the price tag just kept going up and up and up. And separate from that, I went back to the Dexter rep and said, since I'm doing this, let's rip out all this old PVC uh, from behind here. Cause they were redoing um, as, (laughs) as they found the water leak, each line passed there, they were like, hey, and this wasn't built right. Also, this wasn't built right. So this $6,000 repair eventually bled into a 15 and they weren't, they weren't taking me for a ride. Like Mm -hmm. that's what, what reality was every time they'd open a new uh, cover to look at the pipes. So what had happened was a, a discount plumber had come in and put the copper and instead of sweating the copper to the copper to make the valves, um, they just like, uh, like almost tap sealed it with a torch. And so when you went to shut off the valve, it just broke in your hand, which it, it did. It broke in my hand. <laughs> and so we had to rip it all out and, and build it right uh, with, uh, and, and there was nothing to um, stop it. Uh, what's the term hammer? The, um, oh yeah. The water, water hammer. hammer. Yeah. yeah. And so we had to, it, so it, it was a full upgrade. And then I got a new trough at the same time. So the distributor came uh, behind and we got a, 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 tr- a custom made trough from here in Colorado and a $15,000 repair. Essentially um, that was the end of my credit cards. And I went, mm-hmm. okay, all right, I'm, I'm done spending. So I got to go cancel this loan. Um, and, uh, and I had just brought an employee on and I had to let her go. Uh, at the same time, because that was the way I could pay for this. I brought her back um, uh, shortly after as quickly as I could. I brought her back. I just said, I, I can't afford you for this time. Um, I will bring you back as soon as I, I, I can. And I did. Uh, and, and she was a really hard worker. She was just uh, the, the last one I hired. So she was obviously going to be the first one to go uh, in those circumstances. Yeah, that's, uh, that's brutal. And you know, what's double brutal about that is that all that, all that stuff 
it's nothing that anyone will ever see. It doesn't add anything. I mean, obviously it adds a lot to your business because you got to have water to those machines for them to work, but nobody will ever see it. So it's all inside the wall stuff. And so, you know, customers aren't going to be like, Ooh, you got new shiny plumbing back there. Ooh, (laughs) you you see what's inside that bulkhead? (laughs) Exactly. (laughs) Yeah. So that, I mean, that's brutal. That's a hard hit. Um, and that's why I caution people who, you know, want to get into this business uh, with very little money. Um, you know, you can, but there's risk involved. And if something like that happens six, seven months into your your ownership, and it's going to cost you fifteen grand, and you don't have a way to pay for it, well, that could be the end of your business right there. Um, so just something to be aware of. And, and again, that's you know, a worst case scenario, but it does happen. You know. You this happened to you, you know, Ross Dodds, who was uh, I think show nine, his burned down, you know, a couple of days after he bought it. You know, I mean, like stuff happens, right? Like you just gotta be gotta be ready for it. Okay. So sorry I cut your story off, but I was you're like, oh yeah, I started in the vending. You know, oh yeah, I assumed, you know, his debt, and that's how I got in. Oh yeah, we had this fifteen thousand dollar leak. And I'm like, I gotta know more about all of these things. What's going on? Okay, so take us back. We're in the end towards the end of 2019. And you just decided, okay, my my big money is coming from the dry cleaner. Um, you know, my my laundromat is paying the bills. Uh, but if I invest in my dry cleaner, I'm gonna be good to go. Go. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> what what I inherited on the dry cleaning side was a a route full of um, uh, typical uh, dry cleaning customers, a robust route, and I inherited several commercial contracts, um, including police departments, um, and those uh, are good contracts, obviously, um, anchor contracts. And I realized if I got smart on how to bid and uh, solicit more commercial contracts, that's specifically what I meant by my, my dollar, uh, spent on advertising or upgrading the laundromat. If I spent those same dollars on the other side, the return had more potential. Um, and so we, we invested twofold into the dry cleaning side. Um, we started advertising more heavily on the pickup and delivery, including finding other companies that already did it, um, and, and leveraging those platforms. Um, and so there was a local lady that, that uh, had a, a decent um, home-based laundry service. And her model was to just hire housewives to handle three or four people's laundry a month. Well, she grew it to the point where that was untenable and it was very difficult for the quality. And I sat down with her and said, let me be the back end. You go find customers. We'll pick up, deliver and wash it. Um, and we grew that to a certain point. Um, and that started at the end of 2019. Uh, as well as going and getting more commercial contracts. Prior to COVID, um, we had gained a lot of momentum uh, getting more uh, local chiropractors, dentists, um, uh, massage therapy um, contracts, some of which we still have, some of which didn't survive. Um, and then we we had um, some of the other ones already, small gyms, menchies, uh, you know, local yogurt shops, restaurants, whatnot. Um, mm-hmm. So, Going into the end of 2019, I spent a lot of time doing the ownership level stuff, but really getting into the numbers. What are we spending our money on and what are we getting from that? And we started paring down our efforts on um, on certain aspects of the delivery route um, and trying to enhance others. Um, the, the dry cleaning based delivery route was massive and it was what I called a drive and hope route. Um, the driver would leave in the morning with a long list and he'd just come back with whatever was left on the front porch. Sometimes that was good. Sometimes that was four bags, but it was a six hour drive um, to make this loop four, four to six, depending on the driver's experience and the number of, of bags left out. Um, I, I realized that model wasn't sustainable. So I started mm-hmm. researching how to do that. And that's where I also found other platforms that did the, um, that did the, the, the pickup and delivery more successfully with um, more of an on-demand type aspect or an as needed type aspect. And instead of an assigned day. Mm-hmm. Um, and so we were starting to transition to that. And I started to approach more police departments and then um, the world sort of crashed to a halt in, in 2020. Um, and uh, 
very quickly, we lost 85% of our revenue on the dry cleaning side. The, the only things we still had were the police accounts because they were never going away. But that relationship I had made uh, with the local lady, um, she landed in nursing home um, right before the pandemic. And boy, did they need our service. And so all of a sudden we had another anchor account. And so I said, well, uh, we're going to have to pivot. We're going to have to transition. And so um, the thing that happened for me that didn't happen with other dry cleaners um, is I had a whole other side of my business I could leverage. So I used the professional look of the dry cleaning side to go after the biggest and best communities and say, we'll come to you. Um, At the same time, I did lose some walk-in laundry customers. So I did a robust um, Facebook campaign and I did a dollar a pound wash dry full, which is not ever going to happen again. Mm -hmm. (laughs) But I was able to just pay my employees to come to work based on the work that we were able to get through those simple accounts. I made no money, but I didn't lose any money either. I Mm -hmm. paid my bills. I never had to ask. I reached out to the landlord and said, if it goes bad, what are our options? And they laid it out for me. It never, it never ended up going down that path. Um, But I very aggressively um, went after anything that would, and I drove all over Denver, 45 minutes away, hour away. It didn't matter. I would go get it. Um, And we washed anything. um, And, uh, our dry cleaners only ran as, as needed, um, the machines. Um, but we still had a couple of ca- clients that, that sent in, you, you know, stuff every week. Um, and slowly, but surely we started, um, recouping our, we, we started increasing our wash dry fold on pace with what we were bringing in monthly on the dry cleaning side. Mm-hmm. We were, we were fortunate to get the payroll protection as well. Um, about 45 days into this process. And then three months in, we got the EIDL. And that's where I knew with the momentum we were getting and some strategic um, uh, spending, we could we could actually come out ahead during this thing. So long story short, by the end of 2020, we had um, replaced all of our previous revenue with pickup revenue. So I made exactly the same amount of money in 2020 as I did in 2019. Um, I, but I still only was at 75, I'm sorry, 25% of my retail dry clean customers. Um, and I went, we're going to be fine. And again, I was able to leverage, uh, something. So then coming, uh, something else really cool happened at the end of 2020, um, by, by just good fortune, um, a gentleman moved up from Texas, uh, that had robust dry cleaning experience and was just relocating with his family and asked if I had any need for an experienced GM. And, uh, and I don't think he knew exactly, um, what he was getting into. Um, (laughs) but I have been extremely fortunate to have a GM. And I know on a lot of these podcasts, people have talked about having the right person to run the ship. Dave Menz has a tremendous GM. Mm -hmm. She runs that business. Dave's fantastic, but, but she runs the business. (laughs) So Dave can do Dave things, right? He can build, he can build the other parts anyways. So I I got a GM in October of 2020 and I started saying, this is what I'm looking at. And we were in lockstep and we have been since. And he, he is good at two things. uh, The business management of the, the overall company and getting sales. Mm -hmm. So I said, this is what we need. This is what we're going to go do. Um, I was after those police accounts, I had two, uh, going into the end of 2021 at the end, uh, beginning of 2021, we picked up two more. We're about to pick up two more and we have two more that we're negotiating with. So that would get us up to six going on eight. Um, our target is, is 10. Um, and then we would actually have a uh, full-time staff that all they did was pro- process police uniforms, um, tag, wash, press, pick up and deliver police uniforms. That'd be their only job. They'd be pre-vetted. Uh, they get badged, fingerprinted, and they just go do police. So yeah, so pretty pretty seamless for because of my background with the military. Um, a number of my uh, fellow uh, mil- service members um, were in the police departments. And the, the big account that we picked up at the beginning of this year, nobody's given me a better introduction in my life. Um, I, I served with a gentleman who, who's an officer in the military and a, uh, an agent with this uh, specific police department. They call all their officers agents. Like um, that. that sounds and like he gave, strong. I like that. It's, it's really cool. They yeah. get paid a little more too because they're agents. It's <laughs> pretty nice. Yeah. He gave me the best possible intro I ever could have gotten. And they had a, uh, a provider already, um, but it went op- for open bid. And um, we were able to build rapport with them and, and win the bid. 
And um, from there, we picked up another one uh, who linked us to another one. Um, and we brought on a, uh, a commissioned salesperson to go get police departments mm. and um, uh, dental offices. That's his background. He's a, he's a police officer and he has a background in dental as well. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. Yeah, it's tremendous. So, well, that, yeah, yeah the, the commercial, big commercial accounts, as well as residential wash, dry, fold is where we are making all our money. And we're finally starting to get back. Colorado is starting to open. So we're starting to get back our dry cleaning customers. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to have, um, I I've, I've looked at it very specifically as three distinct, but important, um, uh, fingers, uh, for our business. Um, my GM calls them silos, but uh, our, our silos have many silos going underneath them as well. But these three big streams, self-serve coin op, um, dry clean retail side, and then um, pick up and delivery residential and commercial. And they require different equipment. They require different employees and they require different lines of effort. Yeah. I mean, you got, you have, you got the operation going over there, man. You got a lot going on. This, this, you know, kind of failing business that you took over is, is boom it, man. You got, I mean, it's complicated. You got these big three yep. silos. They do, they require different skill sets, different equipment, different employees, it, different systems. You got a lot going on. You're not on the uh, tiny toy candy vending routes anymore <laughs> with this no, thing. No, we're not. <laughs> legitimate business you have going here. Yep. Wow. Okay. So, I mean, dry cleaning's coming back a little bit, right? And I admit that what I love about that is you were able to find a way to pivot you know, during the pandemic, you've, you've kind of clawed your, your way into, uh, you know, residential pickup and delivery and just did whatever it took, what you had to do. And you kind of built this other silo, uh, you know, during the pandemic. And now you're in a pretty good spot where that, that was able to kind of help you keep your dry cleaning side afloat for a little while. And so when it, when it's back, you know, you're going to be in pretty good shape. It seems like. Yes. Yeah. Awesome. And credit, the, the employees pivoted with me. Um, you know, I, the, the lady in the back and, and her staff, they, they're professional dry cleaners. They get paid a little bit more. They're, they're expected to do a little bit more. They transition to going over to the other side and washing laundry all day and folding mm. it um, seamlessly. And they understood um, on their own what, what, what we were trying to do what was at stake, but also what was possible for us. And now they're um, doing partial of each. They're going back to doing uh, more pressing, um, but they're also, uh, it, but in time, you know, they've been rewarded right along with me. Um, we're busy. Um, the, the, the revenue's back, the customers are back. And as a result, I'm, I'm, I'm able to take care of them uh, because they took care of me during a tough time and they stuck with me when we pivoted. I lost no employees. Um, I let no employees go. I, I had some leave during the pandemic for a number of reasons. And, and that's understandable. It was a, uh, mentally a tough time for people, mm -hmm. but I did not let any employees go um, during that time period. Yeah. Yeah. Only when you had the, uh, when the, when you had the big leak and you had to let the new employee was, go. And then bring prior to the pandemic. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> See that man, the water leaks get you more than COVID sometimes. Uh, yeah. man, it's pretty cool. Okay. So, I mean, how's this year been going in terms of your, you know, and, and is the, is the self-serve side, how has that been steady? Has that been growing? Has it been going down as you're doing all this other stuff? Um, so we've put it at risk. Um, it has grown. Mm -hmm. Um, we're to the point now where the, uh, the volume that we're doing, um, because I'm utilizing my, my normal staff, um, we're doing it during the day. And at times people walk in, they look around, they see every piece of equipment is full and they have to leave. Mm -hmm. Um, and I, I offer them other solutions and sometimes we just offer to do their laundry for them, um, for a price. <laughs> mm -hmm. Um, but we, we try to remedy the situation, um, if we can. So what we've been looking at is, uh, late last year, 
um, I took on another retail space in my building Mm -hmm. and we just um, fold and bag laundry out of that space. We're doing roughly four to 5,000 pounds a week on the retail side. So we do it up there. And that way, at least as soon as we can, we get it physically out of the laundromat. It's just a couple, couple uh, doors up from where we are. Um, Since uh, late last year and very aggressively since the beginning of this year, we've been looking at either purchasing a new building, a new laundromat, or a industrial space to build out um, uh, to, to what we to what we want to do, and what I finally settled in on, and now we're going to do a variation of this. Was if I got a six to uh, a six thousand to ten thousand square foot industrial space, mm-hmm. I could offsite my plant and have a massive plant um, as well as OPL, so the on premise push button start laundry, and we could do the majority of that those operations over there. And then we could make the, we could take the laundromat and make it a 4,000 square foot plus modern laundromat, which is what the industry is clearly going to um, with modern amenities, updated equipment, and we could basically retool it. Um, The building owners have uh, historically had zero success renting the basement. It's a 5,500 square foot raw basement with bad access, big staircase, but um, no uh, elevator or anything like that. And it do, it's not super attractive and there's not a ton of parking. Mm-hmm. They're going to give me beyond a sweetheart deal to go down there, including helping me with the build out. So they're going to build the infrastructure if I do the equipment purchase and install. So we're in, we're in the late negotiations on that. And that is my goal. And if we can do that, um, as well as we made an offer last week that uh, uh, has been accepted for a dry cleaner up the street. We're going to actually use them as our plant, do a partial demo of the laundromat and extend it. But um, uh, we're being gifted a, uh, a very large piece of industrial equipment that folds and presses sheets um, at a commercial grade scale. So, so we can go after, um, hotels, nursing homes, um, and things of that nature. And even, um, some of our large scale massage therapy, it would just cut down the work to, to minutes instead of hours. So we, we got, a, 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 we're, we're finding a way to build out our three prongs. Um, and so we're, we're updating and offsiting the plant. We're going to make OPL downstairs mm-hmm. and we're going to extend the basement. And so then we can best serve, our coin op customers, um, as well as having a robust space, we're going to use about a fraction, about a quarter of that 5,500 square feet and only build out that much with the infrastructure to grow as needed. Um, yeah. And then uh, then that will really, that gives us years of, of growth from there. Um, and then I, I might be able to make this thing passive at, at some point. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You're, I was going to say, it's not sounding very passive right now, but you know what? I mean, when you got an operation that you're building, that's on that scale, I mean, you, it takes work and it takes, you know, some hustle and especially on those early, you know, phases. And when the world is, you know, spiraling the drain or whatever, and you're trying to keep your businesses afloat and, you know, it just, but it, you're going to come out hugely on top, man. I mean, essentially you're going to have three successful businesses coming out of this laundromat dry cleaner that you took over taking someone else's debt on. Right. I mean, it's essentially, it, it's a three prong thing, but it, I mean, it's basically three separate businesses that you have going on um, and kind of under one umbrella that, that you're building out. And it sounds like they're all, you know, going to be pretty successful. So yeah, maybe it's not passive right now. Um, but, but you're moving to the big leagues, right? You're not, you know, nope. you're moving to the big leagues. So that's pretty cool. Uh, out of curiosity, would you recommend uh, maybe laundromat owners or somebody, maybe somebody trying to buy a laundromat right now? <clears throat> Would you recommend them going the laundromat dry cleaner route right at this point in time? We're in what, April of 2021. Would you recommend that? Not necessarily. Um, I still don't know anything about dry cleaning. Mm -hmm. Um, (laughs) And I'm being perfectly honest. Um, I don't work the front desk. Uh Um, I don't know how to get a stain out. I don't know how to press a shirt. Um, the only reason mine is successful is because I inherited such knowledgeable staff. And then the gentleman I brought in is, 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 uh, an expert in dry cleaning. 
And, and, and so I was fortunate in that way. Awesome. I, I'm not saying it, it, it's not a great potential, but you need somebody with a lot of experience. The maintenance on dry cleaning is brutal. Um, uh, as well as, as laundry, the difference is it's hot steam. Um, mm-hmm. and there's way less people <laughs> certified to work on it in the greater Denver area. There's a guy, uh, that, that, um, you can find on, on Google, uh, that works on dry cleaning. Um, mm-hmm. even, even going through pipe fitters, um, they, they won't work on the steam. Um, they'll, they'll install boilers and they'll run pipe away from the boiler, but not hooking into the, the equipment. You need steam, you need air. Um, air is not super complicated, but, but, uh, people don't love steam. And then, um, dry cleaning has bad rap. Um, mm-hmm. even, even prior to it, it it's becoming less necessary because people are going to transition away from it. Um, that being said, there's still plenty of garments to say dry clean only, but the chemicals involved, what we found when we started looking at all these spaces is, uh, uh, so we hired an agent, we went on a tour and some of the spaces he told us, they're like, they, they said no, and don't look at any of our properties. We're not interested in having dry cleaning. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, um, some of them have been burned in the past and some of them are still working on a, uh, a notion that everything we do is toxic mm-hmm. in that industry. Um, so the ones that are remediating old dry cleaners, the waste uh, that they that they have to clean in the bill that they're getting is 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 eye popping and it gives them no stomach to uh, even entertain us. Um, they didn't even want to hear me tell them, "Hey, it's changed." Um, uh, but uh, and some of them they immediately ask, "Okay, you work with nasty stuff. How are you going to make it so I'm not liable?" <laughs> a, a fair question. Um, so right. finding an existing space, yes. Um, as long as uh, they get a good environmental hazard study done, um, our building owner just refied the building and they had to do another environmental hazard study. Mm-hmm. Um, and they came and drilled a dozen core samples to uh, uh, 12 feet deep to see if our chemicals had um, gotten to the bedrock, therefore contaminating the water supply. They did not. Um, but in most cases in Colorado, I, I think the guy said there's 20,000 um, percoethylene. So perc is the nasty chemical that was used in uh, dry cleaners forever. 20,000 um, active uh, contamination sites in Colorado. Um, so more complicated than, than laundromat for mm-hmm. sure. And I don't know anything about dry cleaners except for I've been, I've been good at going and getting dry cleaning clientele. Yeah. Um, it yeah. resonates with me. Um, and there is, uh, there is some carryover um, between the two. And I think that they partner extremely well together. So if you either can bring somebody on with the right background or um, in, a, in a number of cases, they're adjacent to one another. Um, oftentimes, uh, laundromat owners just demo the dry cleaner and expand the laundromat. There are, there are instances where I, I, I would say you can attract different, bigger, and more attractive clientele if you have the stomach for the dry cleaning because we can go after partners that I couldn't go after if I was just a dry cleaner. And I always would have built a dry cleaning or a laundromat delivery route. I already had one as a dry cleaner. It was super easy to just expand it. So I have three vehicles now that run pretty constantly to, to service both sides of it. But it was an easy transition because I was already in that space. Yeah, that's a good point. That's a good point. Yeah, I get a little, I get a little scared of dry cleaning. And it's probably just because I don't know a ton about the business. And, you know, it is traditionally a, you know, kind of gets a bad rap and 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 it's just complicated and I'm just not that smart. So, <laughs> yes, <sir. laughs> uh, well, Hey, I, I mean, this, your story is pretty awesome. It's like a pretty cool story going from, you know, from your military background, all, which, you know, thank you for all 20 plus years of service, uh, for one, uh, but doing that and then looking, you know, it's, it's kind of funny. So I have a cousin who just retired from the air force after, I don't know, 20 plus years also. And he, he got out and is trying to figure out like, I mean, he, he's got a path and everything, but it's like, it's just different, right? Because now he has all the options. He can do like what he wants now. And for so long, it's like, you're going to live here. You're going to do this. You're, you know, like, and so, you know, but for you coming out of that and saying, okay, I'm going to, you know, start a vending route. And then from that, kind of pretty quickly jumping into laundromats and dry cleaning and then pretty quickly again, scaling that business is that's pretty awesome. Uh, just a pretty awesome progression that you've been going through. Um, we got a section called down to business. Uh, let's get down to business. Over and out. 
And that's where we just, I mean, you've already told us a lot about your business, but I'm just, I'm curious, you know, we'll, we'll probably focus a little more on the laundromat side. Uh, but you know, even for, you know, the dry cleaner in your, in your pickup and delivery stuff too. Uh, but tell us again, where are you located? Yes. I'm uh, just outside of the Denver metro area, small town, not small town, but a town called Arvada. Um, but I touch the the greater Denver region. Um, so for all intents and purposes, Denver, Colorado. Yeah. Awesome. Denver is awesome. I like, I like Denver. That's wonderful. Yeah. Okay. So you have one laundromat, mm-hmm. one dry cleaner, but yep. you're acquiring another, another one. Yep. Are you, are you, when you acquire that other one, are you, I know you said you were going to do like a partial demo. What are you doing with the dry cleaning space that you currently have? Are you? We're going to current, uh, we're going to um, uh, further siphon it. So what our intent is, is to at the new bigger one, it will be our residential dry cleaner. So we'll run all the police through there and all of our residential pickup and uh, delivery and, and in store uh, uh, walking customers. Okay. Um, with the current one, we're going to partially demo it and we're going to do all of our large commercial uh, uh, industrial work there, including that the, those pieces of equipment we're getting. Yeah. And so all of our large scale wash dry fold operations will, will happen there. Yeah. Um, but they require dry cleaning uh, processes. Now, uh, we're, we'll probably shut the dry cleaning machine down. What we're going to keep up and running is all the pressing equipment. Okay. Uh, the press sheets and towels and things like that. So did you get that big folder like for your birthday or something? You said it was gifted to you. Partners. Uh, we, 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 uh, the GM I brought on um, I had some good relationships down in Texas. We reached out to them to build something. They said, you know what? We believe in what we're doing. We're going to give you this machine. <laughs> <laughs> That's so awesome. Yeah, it, it was, uh, it was unexpected. It's, it's, it's a really, they're going to, we're going to pay to ship it and install it. Um, but, uh, it, it, it's gonna, it's gonna open a, um, a pathway for us. That's, uh, really massive. Yeah. Yeah. Pretty cool. Another thing, I mean, I, we didn't really, you've been saying this, but we didn't really like pinpoint this. One of the things I really love that you're doing is, and some of it you're doing on purpose and some of it you're just kind of quote unquote looking into, but like you seem like you're really, really good at going out, getting accounts and, you know, and kind of driving the business forward and, you know, it cracking me up when you say you don't even know how to get a stain out or you don't know anything about dry cleaning. Right. And you're buying your second <laughs> plant. Right. <laughs> um, but, uh, but you're, you're really good at doing, you know, go, going to get accounts and <clears throat> you're also really good at, or really lucky or both at getting other people to do things that are really good at the things that either you're not good at, or you don't want to do, or you just don't want to learn about. (laughs) Um, And I, I mean, I think that's a huge, I I don't want to like gloss over that because I think that's a huge uh, characteristic of someone who's successful, right? Is do the things that you're really good at and get other people to do the things that you're not good at, who are good at those things. Right. And you've said multiple times, like I inherited this staff and they're really good. They know all this stuff. Right. Awesome. You know, I lucked into this Texas guy who's just really good and he knows all this stuff. Right. Like awesome. You know, and then hiring a, a commission sales rep to go get nursing homes and, and police uh, or no dentists and police uh, you know, accounts just like awesome. Like, right. So I just, I, I didn't want to gloss over that because I think it's a really important point of something that I think you're doing really well, whether it's on purpose or an accident or whatever, irrelevant <laughs> uh, because <laughs> it's happening. Right. And it's, and it's working. So, um, okay. So when did you, when did you buy all this stuff again? You said in 2019, February, February 1st, 2019, February just 1st. over two years. Wow. Oh, man, you've come a long way in two years, man. I love it. It's been that. a ride. <laughs> uh, in terms of your coin laundry, can you talk to, talk to us about what, what does it cost to do laundry? Yep. Um, uh, we kept it pretty simple. We're, a, we're a dollar bigger than the machine. So the horizons are three bucks, the thirties are four, the forties are five, the the sixties are seven. Um, uh, as part of the, so I am starting the retool on the laundry side, regardless of, of whether we grow it out or not. Um, and, and I'll get, bigger equipment. I'll do the same thing. It'll be a dollar more than the size of the machine. Yeah. Cool. I like, I like the simplicity of that. Uh, do you have any sense of like how many turns per day you're doing in that laundromat? 
we're we're over four um, of of coin turns. We use the equipment so much that the the equipment life is getting way more turns than that. But as far as like monetary terms, we're over four. Um, but we get uh, we get fully half of that on Sunday. Yeah. Um, we we get we get if if I was just to break it up between Monday through Saturday and Sunday, it's half and half. Um, sun, Sunday's huge. <laughs> that's crazy. Just going nonstop on Sunday. Yeah, uh, that's pretty good. Uh, or do you have people who are attending your laundromat side fully or you partially or what, how are you handling that? It's, it's, uh, because we have a front desk dry cleaning person at all times, they, they pop in and out of the laundry to help to break change and all that. So we're, we're partially attended without it being intentional. Mm -hmm. And then I have so many, uh, I have four to five people processing laundry in the laundromat all day. They're also helping. That being said, we just hired a a gentleman that starts on Monday and he'll be from two o'clock to 10 o'clock and his job title, especially later in the day is a tent laundromat attendant. Um, He's going to help with the, uh, the wash dry fold up to a certain point. And then we, we close it for the day anyways, uh, on, on our end. Um, and then he'll close the laundromat. So he'll pull in, clean, help customers, all that stuff until 10 PM. And then he'll shut the doors. They auto lock after that, but, uh, we have a lot of people to prop the doors and stay after I, I've been calling the police a lot. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You got to stay on top of that. It's, it's, you know, that's just everywhere. Uh, are you doing coin only no card? At this point, um, we, we are, are at the beginning of a retool. Um, we will order equipment soon. Uh, we'll have it sometime this year, it looks like. Um, and then and then we will start adding coin, or uh, I'm sorry, card. And then we will be a hybrid store, but coin only. Hybrid. Yeah. yeah, I like that. I like that. And right, how, how many hours do you think you're spending right now? I mean, you're in like mega growth mode in three different businesses. So expecting a relatively large number, but you, you got a ballpark of how many hours a week you're spending? I do. Uh, it, it, it's up to 60, um, between 50 and 60. That being said, um, with the way that the day-to-day operations are set up, um, I'm going to get at least, uh, four weeks away. Um, I'm, I've already had, um, uh, two, one week of vacations. So first week of January, uh, then over spring break, I'm going to Mexico here pretty quick, nice. uh, I'm going away for the fourth. So, um, I, I spend a lot of time when I'm there, but when I leave, I leave. And I don't, I don't hear uh, from, from the GM while I'm gone. Um, unless uh, he, he texted me last time with a list of uh, accomplishments. Um, like, all the, <laughs> like he went and got some more accounts. Um, hey, some it's like way more. better when you're not yeah. here. Yeah. yeah. I, I, that, I, that was my response. I was like, so I should be gone more. Yeah. <laughs> um, so that's, there, there were fires, small fires put out, but he's well equipped to, to handle those. At, like at literal this fires? No. <laughs> oh, <okay. laughs> no. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That's awesome. That's all. And you know what? Like, man, I would love for employees to be bragging to me about how good things are going when I'm not there. That's because I mean, right. Like that's the goal. You said, hopefully it'll be more passive down the line. Well, that's, that's the way you get there and making them feel good about them running that business. Well, when you're not there is, you know, that's key. Awesome. Well, we got a section called secret sauce. Listen up. It's the secret sauce. Secret sauces for current owners. You know, what's something that's working really well in your business that you feel like other people can implement into their businesses to help them improve? So uh, I I had these questions ahead of time. So I had some time to think about this and I wrote down pivot and partners. So what's worked uh, really well for me is, is uh, partnering with uh, people that that, uh, already know how to do this. Um, Most recently we partnered with happy nest. Um, tremendous opportunity. We went and hung out with Dave. Um, also tremendous opportunity. You know, we just got talking about what a, a highly functional team looks like. That's a highly functional team he's got mm-hmm. out there. He's got a, a staff that enjoy what they're doing. Um, he treats them well. He, he rewards them well. So partnering with people like that, but um, even locally, uh, I, I have a, a distributor I'm, I'm very close with. This outfit out of Texas is, is helping us do some these big projects. Yeah. And um, we've pivoted repeatedly as uh, called for. And then we found out what works within those uh, market segments. Yeah. I think that's great. I mean, that's kind of what I was saying too. Like you did an awesome job of pivoting and you're doing a really awesome job of partnering with people who are doing the things that either you don't know how to do or don't want to know how to do. (laughs) Um, So, I mean, I think that's great. And not only did you bring 
some amazing, amazing secret sauce, but you used alliteration. So you get bonus points for that. <laughs> uh, all right. We got another section called pro tips. Pro tips. And pro tips is for the newbie, somebody trying to get their first laundromat. What advice would you give to them? All right. You're going to love it. Uh, learn and launch. Yes. All right. So figure out what it takes and go after it. Um, that's easy for me to say, right? Because I didn't figure out anything. I just went after it. But um, as I got into it and realized that it required uh, me to, to do some learning, I did. I, 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 I really, I spent evenings, I spent weekends. Um, I was so excited when I started finding laundromat podcasts were available um, and, and, and books. And the, the industry has never been more ripe. CLA, uh, you know, all these organizations have fantastic and robust amounts of information. Um, uh, y- yourself, Dave, there's several other mentors out there that can um, help people uh, avoid the pitfalls and, and you know, realize truly what it takes, but also give them encouragement to go, hey, you've been looking into this, get after it. So learn, then launch. <laughs> yeah, I love that. And double bonus points for double alliteration. So, I mean, you're you're on fire today. Uh, all right. Well, we got another section called recommended resources and just, Hey, what, what resources would you recommend to help people grow themselves personally or their businesses? Uh, so uh, there's a book that really resonates with me. I've read it a couple of times. I'll read it again soon. It's extreme ownership. Uh, Jocko Willink. He's got a podcast as well. He's got a military background that, that that's an easy, uh, easy bridge for me, but his, um, the <clears throat> concepts that he takes and puts in uh, to business and it's specifically at the ownership level. Um, if something goes wrong, it's never anybody's fault, but your own. And he mm-hmm. explains that extremely well. It's not um, a myopic look at, at um, ownership. It's and it's an aggressive look at, you know, if you didn't train them well enough, that's on you. If you didn't prepare them well enough, if you didn't prepare the battlefield, the scene, the, the store, just really like how he breaks it down in his approach. It's an aggressive approach, but I appreciate it. Yeah. I love that book and I love that recommendation. So I'm going to give you bonus points for that too. Triple bonus points today. (laughs) Um, No, but I love, uh, I love that because it's the, it's the polar opposite of the um, you know, of the mindset that we run into a lot. I feel like in our industry um, and with a lot of our clientele, which is nothing is my fault. You know, everything is someone else's fault. And you know, basically his premise is nothing is ever anyone else's fault. It's always on you. So take ownership of it. And when you take ownership of it, it gives you control of the situation. If it's somebody else's fault, you're a victim. There's nothing you can do about it. Right. And there's no, there's no action to be taken. And his point is, you know, if you take ownership of everything, so if somebody, one of your employees does something wrong and you take responsibility for it, now you have the ability to take some action to solve that problem. And I, I mean, I just, I love that premise. I love the book. Awesome recommendation. If you have not read it, I'll put a link to it uh, down below. If you haven't read it, uh, go get it or rent it from the library or an audiobook or something. Cause it's, it's awesome. Very good resource. Well, Hey man, this has been, I've literally, I've been riveted this entire time from the vending, uh, uh, business that you started to the way that you acquired your laundromat and dry cleaner to, uh, your $15,000 leak down to you scaling out these kind of three, three prongs of your business, which is kind of three businesses and the way that you're going about it. I just, I'm like, I'm leaving this thing super excited because you know, your energy is just infectious. And I love, you know, and I thought your secret sauce was perfect because it perfectly describes everything, your, your whole story, right? Um, just, you know, pivot and then partner with the right people. And, you know, you're, you're bound for success that way. That's, you know, that's the way that you go. So this has been awesome. I have one more question for you. If people have any questions for you, what's the best way they can get a hold of you? Um, maybe they just want to say thank you for sharing, or maybe they have questions about, you know, how to get a stain out of a shirt or something. How do they get a hold of you? <laughs> hey, I, I have that answer because I have somebody that does. Yeah. <laughs> you talk to my GM guy over here. <laughs> yep. Um, so it's Eli, uh, E L I at Sunshine Dry Clean, but the the clean is abbreviated. So it's Sunshine D R Y C L N dot com. Sunshine Dry Clean dot com. Awesome. Well, hey, thank you again for sharing your story. And I just, yeah, I'm just, I'm pretty jazzed about 
you and everything that you're doing. So I appreciate you sharing it and looking forward to staying in touch. And uh, we'll have to have you back on to see how your, uh, your OPL goes and your new acquisition for your new dry cleaning plant. And who knows, probably next time we have you on, you'll have, you'll have spread over all of Colorado or something. I don't know. On. <laughs> <laughs> well, thanks again, man. And we'll talk to you again soon. Thank you, Jordan. All right. That was an awesome, awesome interview with Eli. Dude, I just am so psyched up. Like his energy is infectious and his, just his story and the way that he uh, delivers it. And also just the path that he's taken, his secret sauce of pivoting and partners. Uh, It was my big takeaway today. Every single week, I encourage you pick something from the interview to put into practice. And for me, it was that pivoting and partners point that he made uh, where, you know, pivot when you need to pivot and partner with the best people out there. And, you know, I've said it before on here, you know, when you work with the best, you become the best. And Eli, I think is proof of that. Not, I mean, he was obviously, he's an awesome guy. Uh, you know, from, from the get go, even before he got into this, but partnering with the right people in this industry is really, I mean, I am blown away by the business he's, he's building, uh, in such a short amount of time in this industry. And a big part of that is getting partnered up with the right people. So do that, uh, no matter where you're at on your journey, whether you are, you know, just getting started, or if you have been doing laundromats for a long time and you're a pro, there's, there's more growth to be had there. So find people who are, pushing you to be bigger and better. That's what I'm doing uh, right now in in who I'm networking with, who I am spending my time with, my whole, um, you know, five people closest to me thing. I'm trying to push outside of my comfort zone, outside of my boundaries to uh, to grow. And, you know, that's something that, that we all can do. So pick your one thing, go to the forums and share what your one thing is that you're putting into action this week. And we will see you again next week here on the Laundromat Resource Podcast. And between now and then, hopefully we'll see you on the forums.